a bold, courageous, inspiring life. There's no other life to live, you know, and you, you don't have uh, any other moment but this moment. So if you're talking about it, you're never going to get it done. Hello, everyone. It's episode 80 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists, like today's guest, Mr. Taimok Guariello. My name's Jeremy Lesniak, and I founded Whistlekick. I'm also your host for Martial Arts Radio. Whistlekick, as so many of you know already, makes the world's best sparring gear, as well as really great apparel and accessories, all for practitioners and fans of traditional martial arts. I'd like to welcome our new listeners and thank those of you checking us out again. If you're not familiar with our products, head on over to whistlekick.com and take a look at what we make. Our sweatpants are probably the most comfortable thing you'll ever wear, so definitely have a look at those. Now, if you want to see the show notes, those are on a whole different website, and that's whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. While you're over there, go ahead and sign up for the newsletter. We offer special content to subscribers, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. We only email a few times a month. We never sell your information. And sometimes we even throw in a coupon code. Now let's talk about the episode. Our guest today is the star of one of the most beloved martial arts films of all time, Mr. Taimok Guariello. The Last Dragon is one of those rare martial arts films that had an impact that transcended martial arts culture and could be felt in general society. Here we are, 80 episodes in, and the news of Mr. Guariello's appearance created more buzz than any other guest we've had. While even his first name is synonymous with his role in the 1985 movie, there's a lot more to him than his time as Leroy Green, both as a man and as a martial artist. We get to know a lot about both of those sides, and I hope you enjoy your time with him as much as I did. Mr. Guariello, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thanks for having me. Hey, it's an honor to have you here. And of course, for for anyone that stumbled onto this that doesn't know who you are, you're our first... um, I would say, martial arts movie celebrity that we've had on the show. So that's kind of fun. And anyone that does recognize your name knows that you are, were, depending on how you want to look at it, the star of The Last Dragon. Great movie, cult movie. Has quite a strong place in the martial arts community. And it's really an honor to have you on here. And of course, you've spent plenty of time, I'm sure, over the last 30 years talking about the movie, but we want to get to know you a little bit more. So why don't you tell us how you got started in the martial arts? Yeah, uh, my father was a good-looking kid, and a lot of, he would get picked on in his neighborhood. So he he made a commitment to himself that when he had children and got married and everything, that he would make sure his children knew how to protect themselves. So when ever since I was like five, six years old, my um father had me training with uh, his good friend, Gerald Orange, who was a karate expert. Uh, so that's how I got started uh, in martial arts. It was due to my father not wanting me to go through what he went through. Yeah. So is that, I'm, sh- I'm guessing you've had the opportunity to train in some other things some oh, other, yeah. with some other people? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. That was the beginning, you know? Okay. Uh, All right. the, I stopped training was, I was in Europe and I was engulfed in what we call football, not soccer. <laughs> <laughs> and that like consumed my every being from when I was like eight to 12, 13. And I came back to the States and I was fanatic about Bruce Lee at that time, at the end of my stay in Europe. And I started training martial arts again, but with Aikido at a place called The Door in New York City. It was a community center for young kids uh, to have, you know, you know, they had privately funded and stuff. So, uh, but but that, even though that was great, the teacher was great, Ralph King, uh, I wanted to be like Bruce Lee, and Bruce Lee did all these uh, great movements and especially kicks. So I was about 14 or 15 and I was walking around looking for Taekwondo schools all over the place. My father was pretty independent with me and my brother letting us roam anywhere we wanted to. <laughs> it was a different world now, but sure. uh, ever since I was a little kid, we would be everywhere. 
It's me and my brother. He's a year and a half, two years older. And uh, I ended up studying Taekwondo at the Richard Chun School in East Manhattan, East Side, on 86th Street. And I stayed there for a while, and then I started competing in Taekwondo and getting on the tournament scene, and, you know, karate tournaments and Taekwondo tournaments. And I did very well. I was a little heavy with the kicking, and I would get disqualified. And uh, I think that had a lot to do with growing up learning to kick a ball really hard <laughs> yeah <laughs> so um then uh, uh i saw the movie the black dragon and i wanted to meet ron van cleef and my father said oh we know ronnie and uh, he took me to a basement in lower east side and ron van cleef had me uh doing push-ups and uh deep knee bends and squats and punches and hitting everything in the in the dojo <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was, it was very intense and crazy. And, you know, I, I, I stayed with him for a while, his top student. Then I started uh, kickboxing. Way There was only one kickboxing studio. Even though Ron Van Cleef did full contact, I wanted some place that was more orientated towards kickboxing. I found the one kickboxing studio in New York. There weren't very many at that time. It was uh, 1983 or four. And... Uh, I ended up at City Star Boxing and Kickboxing Gym. Uh, before that, I was doing a little boxing with my stepfather. He ran a famous boxing gym. He was a, a boxing coach. His name was Donald Hayes. And he taught boxing at Times Square Boxing, but I wanted to kickbox. I didn't want to box. Um, so I met people like Yol Yuda at City Star Boxing Gym in Queens, who was a kickboxing champion and boxer, and he's Zab Judah's father. And we would spar and other people. There was Tony Arnold. There was a, it was a very, very cold gym with no heating. So the bags were like ice. <laughs> you know? So, you know, today I train with, a, you know, I, I do my own thing, you know, when it comes to like karate and uh, boxing and all those things. But, but I, I wanted to learn grapple uh, from Marcelo Garcia, grappling Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Uh, years back, about five years ago, I started with him. I'm a purple belt with him, and I, I really love the academy and everybody there, and it's a wonderful place here in Manhattan. So here we have you know, quite a diverse upbringing, but it uh, seems like we've got a little bit of a common thread of basements and, and the cold. And you know, It's funny, we have a lot of people on the show that say that same thing, that a lot of their early introductions to the martial arts were almost this dungeon atmosphere. <laughs> yeah. And I, I wonder if uh, uh, yeah. I wonder if some of the early movies uh, you know, were kind of pushing that on everyone. Because, you know, we think about early martial arts movies and you know, everybody was training in these rough conditions and you know, then maybe that's what people were expecting of martial arts in the US at that time. I don't know. Well, you know, um, a lot of the martial artists they came from the military like my instructor at the time, you know? So they grew up as military men, you know? They brought karate over to, and judo and all that over to the States from Japan. Yeah. yeah. Cool. cool. So that gives us a little bit of context about who you are and how you got started. And I'm sure that throughout your career, you know, both both your martial arts career and, and your your movie career, you've had the chance to see and do and experience quite a few things. And I know you got a lot of stories in there, but if you could take a second and give us the best one you can, you got. Yeah. I'm looking for an inspirational one rather than, <laughs> cause there were some ones that were violent that I don't, sure. I don't like to remember. Uh, um, You know, over the years, just seeing so many young people uh, develop their their uh, athletic talents. You know, yeah. um, one of the first was Ernie Reyes Senior with his uh, his team that would travel around the country doing amazing demonstrations, and then obviously his son. His first film, Ernie Reyes Jr.'s first film, was The Last Dragon. You know, he was one of the 
kids that was the top kata competitor in the country. Um, you know, and I think for me, it was always inspirational to watch these kids from the smallest kids to like 14, 15, get better and better and better. You know, you, you know, they may lack some of the traditional aspects of it, but just to see that, that was, you know, the most inspirational to me. Uh, I can't think of one specific story. I mean, I remember that when I did The Last Dragon, I would go to tournaments and these young people would just go crazy. And uh, I remember Demetrius Angelo, who runs the um, uh, Urban Action Showcase and Expo. It's an independent film festival that takes place in New York every fall in November. And it's really growing into something huge. He um, he became friends with me later, and in, and had me um, inducted into his. Um, he was honoring me and uh, Michael J. White and other people at you know Fred Williamson, Ron Van Cleef at, at his event, and um, he reminded me where I met him, and it was when I was appearing at in Washington, at um, uh, ah man Kung Fu style at the top of my head his name. But he has a huge martial arts tournament, and I was visiting the tournament, and he said, man, I never forget what you told me. When you showed up, you were my hero. And I was about 15, and he, I, he said that you smiled at me and said, you're great now, but keep training. And he said, and I never forgot that, and I kept training. And here I am today, getting able to you know, work with you on some things. You know, so. How old were you, do you think, before you realized that you had that kind of influence on the youth? Uh, well, as soon as I did the movie, I mean... That, you recognized it right off. Yeah, I mean, uh, because that movie, even though adults love it, I mean, smallest kids love it equally or more, you know? It's just, yeah. That was a smart move on their part, not to have it be bloody and violent, over sexual gratuitous, you know, and all that stuff, you know? Yeah. Did you, was it, was there ever a point where, you know, that, I don't know if that, I want to say power, but that level of influence, did it feel heavy to you? Yeah, because when I was younger, I was insecure with so many things, you know, um, around uh, who I was and where I came from. And, uh, you know, I didn't, you know, you, you know, it, to hit all corners of your identity, uh, uh, being a young person, is is very difficult. You know, absolutely. You need you need uh, you need support, and you need to uh, be able to have a someone that that's got great integrity and and honor and. Um, someone that that is generous and courageous that can help guide you you know and i didn't really have that person you know hmm. so i i learned mostly on my own you know and which was fine it's fine for me that's yeah i'm sure i was told many things that i didn't listen to um yeah So imagine if we were to roll back and, you know, your, your father didn't have that desire for you to learn how to defend yourself. You never found the Taekwondo school. You never became inspired by Bruce Lee. Martial arts never became part of your life. What do you think your life would look like now? What, what do you think you'd be doing? Um, that's like martial arts is such an integral part of my life since I was a kid. You know, it's hard to really envision a life that's not like that. Um, but I'd probably be singing opera at the Met. <laughs> really? No, I'm just joking. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make you laugh. Uh, I would love to have been a soccer player. Um, I, you know, uh, if martial arts wasn't, I'd love, uh, maybe, uh, architect building. You know, I love design. I love design. I love teaching, uh, working with young people. 
uh, yeah, I can't think of. Uh, it's it's hard to think that way, you know. Yeah, it, it is, you know, and, and and honestly, that's the question that most of our guests, I don't want to say struggle with, but you know, it's hard to conceptualize, and and people have turned it back around on me. You know, what would I do? And and I have the same challenge that you do, and I, I think that's because for some of us, martial arts is really part of our destiny. And we leave that question in just to show that it doesn't matter who you are, where you're coming from, what style you've studied. There are some people that really belong in the martial arts and it becomes such a core part of who they are. Yeah. I think uh, another way to pose it um, would could be uh, if you weren't doing martial arts or, or even not even if you don't even address that side of it, you say, what other things that, you know, you think you could really be passionate about as a career, you know, maybe that, because when I think about martial arts and not doing it, it's very foreign to me. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I can relate. Yeah. So you might've hinted at, at some of these and I, I don't want to press you for, for details that you're not willing to share, but you mentioned some of the um, less than positive stories that came with uh, your career and maybe this is part of them, but I'd like you to think about a low point, something tough, challenging that popped up in your life and how your martial arts training or experience helped you move through it. Yeah, well, you know, I write about a lot of that in my autobiography, obviously. Uh, I get into the details. Uh, but there's been many moments of um, uh, romantic breakups with women, uh, you know, the, when I was younger uh, and uh, things like uh, career, uh, the, the, the misunderstanding between Barry Gordy and I about uh, what my role was uh, going forward after The Last Dragon and, and uh, how best for us to do a follow-up to The Last Dragon and... Uh, um, you know, there's been plenty of things, and most of the time, uh, I go within myself uh, and look to uh, just learn, you know? And for me, the martial arts, um, you know, I learned a lot about the um, how to deal with things from growing up watching these uh, Shaw Brothers movies when I was a kid. You know, all the Shaolin instructors and the uh, stories that they were told were really influ influential to me. Uh, and having heroes that were so bold and courageous like Muhammad Ali and Bruce Lee, you know, I didn't see uh, how I could ever give up on anything, you know? Yeah. Sure. So uh, uh, for me, uh, that's what part of the martial arts is like, the courage and, and, and you know, to keep going. That, that, that's been the most important thing, you know? So you mentioned some pretty big names and people that have really had quite a profound impact on the martial arts, be it, you know, through their instruction or through movies that have been part of your life. But if there was someone that you would single out and say, this person was, was really the most influential in my martial arts upbringing outside of your direct instructors, who, who would you say that was? Well, I'd say obviously Bruce Lee, you know, because, uh, you know, he had such an impact. He had the strongest impact on my life as a, as a person. You know, up, you know, as a kid, you know, uh, Muhammad Ali and Bruce Lee were the most uh, influential in my life. Okay. So Bruce Lee is certainly an answer that we've heard on the show before, but Muhammad Ali hasn't had a lot of mention. So what was it about him and his career that you found influential? He had a lot of respect for himself and a lot of courage, you know, to do the things that weren't, you know, 
uh, uh, you know, I think um, people like Dave, David Bowie and Prince, you know. Oh, excuse me one second. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, David Bowie and Prince, um, you know, I have these ambiguous, ambiguous artists that have the courage to just be who they're going to be. And Muhammad Ali was that kind of guy, you know. He was faced with a lot of racists that didn't want him to succeed, and 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 it was a very bad time for to be black in America, you know, during his career. And he made bold, courageous choices. So outside the ring, as well as inside the ring, you know, and that was very impressive. Yeah, he's certainly not someone when you think of him and what he's known for. He didn't back down from anything, whether it was a, a verbal challenge or a physical one. Yeah, he was amazing. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier that you'd participate in some competition. Maybe you were a le little heavy with your feet. Tell us, tell us a little bit more about your time in the ring and what you learned and what you enjoyed. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's funny because uh, when I was going to these kickboxing events and there was no money really <laughs> <laughs> it's like, all right, you fight this guy. I didn't like it, you know. I was like, uh, I need to make some money. Uh, and I was doing, you know, I didn't really uh, see myself as a brute, like a lot of bouncers, but I was hired uh, to do some bouncing as well. So uh, I fought a guy in, um, in Jerome Boxing Gym for a New York State kickboxing title. And... Uh, I write about all this in my book, um, but uh, it was uh, funny because I wasn't, uh, I didn't feel, even though the, the trainer was good, I it was always edgy, you know, like you never feel like you're, at least for me, I didn't feel like, I felt I was good, but I felt I had a lot more to do before I got in the ring, you know, <laughs> so I, was, yeah. I had a lot of talent, but I was wild. You know, and I would just fight, you know, <laughs> uh, I think until you have maybe 30 fights or 20 something fights, you start to hone in and get more crafty, you know, but I, I was successful, you know, and I, you know, did pretty well. I mean, and, and I, I, you know, even the karate tournaments, even though they're not full contact, I think you get an opportunity to work on uh, craftiness and your timing and your distance and, you know, speed and relaxation, you know, that, that helped with when it came to full contact, you know? Sure. Yeah. What was, what was it about the, the competition side, the, you know, pitting yourself against some, somebody else? What did you enjoy about that? Well, I was a kid that was bullied a lot and, you know, I was, went through some abusive things and uh, it was kind of, I was introverted, even though it wasn't really the way I sh I think I would have been naturally. Uh, so there was a lot of fire in me to express myself that I couldn't express myself outside of getting uh, in a, a fight, in karate. And I wasn't a guy that liked fighting the street, but I didn't like violence, but I, I did love hitting and and another guy you know and uh it was more like i was fighting back for my life you know uh and you know just getting uh ownership over myself you know so it was really intense for me hmm. and i didn't know it at the time you know but as i got older i realized that's what i enjoyed about it that i was able to fight back on equal playing field because my brother was older than me. <laughs> so he was always, he would always get the better edge on me. <laughs> so when I had another kid in front of me around my size or age, I would try to annihilate him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was, a, I was like, I remember uh, Jerry told me, Jerry Fastweet Fontaine is a friend of mine. He was a, one of the best point fighters I ever seen. And he, when we fought, I tried to kill him. He said he was so scared. <laughs> 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 oh, it was funny <laughs> yeah you had that fire and you certainly had to, you needed somewhere to direct it i guess right right <laughs> yeah. 
you know. Yeah. Were, were there any other avenues for you to get that emotion out other well, than in the room? acting? That's uh, obviously must have been why I fell into that as destiny. You said before, um, yeah. Uh, I think uh, the acting was a way for me to express and then learn how to grow as a person, you know? Yeah. It was great. I love it. You're still passionate about acting today? Well, I've been acting since the last year. I've been doing mostly theater, right. though. Um, but, uh, in fact, you know, in, in my book, at the end of the book is a, a treatment – uh, for a, a sequel to The Last Dragon that, you know, would stand on its own merits. It's not a copy of the original one. It's a, uh, it makes some connections. There are new characters. It's, 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 it'll extend the martial arts aspect of it, uh, further as well. Yeah. So, uh, that's, there's other snippets of some screenplays I've wrote that I put in there as well. And some poetry that I put in my autobiography. So yeah, there's a lot going on. So, so you're just an artist overall. Yeah. It sounds like you've got different ways for, for directing that passion. And I think that's great. Yeah. Fantastic. So if you could train with somebody else, somebody, somebody that you hadn't had a chance to, and I'm pretty sure that your, your answer off the top would be Bruce Lee. So I'm going to take that one off the table. If you could train with somebody that you hadn't had, a, had the chance to, you know, be they alive or dead. Who would it be? And I guess if, if you want to use Bruce Lee, I'm going to ask you to do a second one. As well, well. I, I'm training with Marcelo Garcia because I, I wanted to uh, study uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And when I saw him, I thought he would be the perfect person. I didn't know he was in New York. So it just happened to be that when, when we met, we hit it off. We really liked each other. And I've been there ever since. I'm a purple belt with him. And uh, I love training there and love, uh, love the academy all the guys and, and girls in there and it's great. And, uh, that's who I really enjoy training with, uh, and, uh, learning his, uh, style of grappling. That's uh, very unique and very expansive in that it, it's ever evolving, you know? And that's what I like about Marcelo. Uh, um, other than Marcelo, uh, there's so many amazing martial artists out there. Uh, um, off the top of my head, I can't think. You know, I've seen, but a name doesn't call to me right now. Okay. Was what was it about grappling that drew your interest? Had you had any experience with jujitsu? Yeah, I, I yeah little? I studied a little bit with Marcel. I'm um, no, sorry, with um, Joe Marrero, who was cool and great. Alan Goes, who was a former champion, he was a friend of Marcelo's. I mean, sorry, I say Marcelo, a friend of uh, 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 Joe Morero, uh, Alan Goes. He used to come by and teach a little bit. Um, uh, and also, of course, uh, the Gracies, who brought Jiu Brazilian Jiu Jitsu to, to America, and uh, they were very impressive. But I always liked uh, grappling. I just, you know, never got a chance to do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu until it came to America in such a bold way. Mm. So let's talk about movies. Now, obviously, your movie is a classic. I mean, there's, you know, we don't, we don't have to even discuss that. It's, it's, it's up there. I mean, when I, when I see lists, you know, we were talking before the show about some of the the ways that I, I've heard of the impact and I've seen the impact of The Last Dragon on my life and on my friends' lives. But what other movies have you found to be significant for you? Uh, I, I think the uh, Samurai series with uh, Lupin, Wolf, and Cobb, uh, Shogun's Assassin, Into the Dragon, uh, Bruce Lee films, uh, Sonny Chiba, um, but uh, the Seven Samurai, you know, the Samurai films had a lot of impact on strength and honor and, uh, you know, Zen, you know, it's, it's like, if you're going to make a move, you better make it. <laughs> Don't think, you know? Yeah. Uh, and uh, with the, the Shaolin films, you know? And obviously, Five Deadly Venoms was one of my favorites, uh, you know. 
you know, you, you, you get, it's just, there's so many uh, great stories in these films. Uh, the Master Killer series with Gordon Liu. Uh, I love uh, Stephen Chow. If I, if, I a, if there's an opportunity that I can create with him, I would love to work with him. You know, Kung Fu Hustle, Shaolin Soccer. The list goes on, you know. Yeah. As you've been talking, I it really... mentioned Donnie Yen. Donnie Yen is a great... <laughs> Yeah, he's. Some would say, and 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 I think I'd probably be in that list. Uh, one of the greatest martial arts actors, maybe even the greatest working today. Right, he's just absolutely incredible with what he's been able to do. Right, Michael Jai's done right. Michael Jai White's done very well. With, oh, absolutely. With his career. Yeah, yeah, fantastic martial artist, fantastic guy, and uh, yeah, um been lucky enough to to meet him we've got some some common ties and hoping to have him on the show at some point sure but hearing you know a little bit of a of a common thread as we've you know throughout what we've talked about it seems like the philosophical aspects of martial arts really draw to you or you're, you're drawn to them you know am i reading that right yeah yeah i mean that's that's correct i mean uh Everybody can, you know, lift weights and, you know, go learn how to fight. But learning how to live was what martial arts is about, not about just the, the physical aspects of it. That's what everybody gets caught up in. But that's just, that's that's only about 20% of what martial arts is, if that. Yeah. So you mentioned, you know, some great movies. You mentioned some great actors. Let's... Let's talk about what's keeping you going. I mean, obviously, you know, it's a big time of your life right now, the 30-year anniversary of, of The Last Dragon. You're out, you're touring, you've got your book. I mean, there's a lot going on. And we'll hear all about that in a second. But what is it that's keeping you motivated? I mean, you're, you're, you're charging forward. You're not slowing down. It doesn't sound like it. Oh, all. no, I'm speeding up. So, <laughs> speeding up. So, I'm awesome. going to be, so, I'm gonna be what's keeping you going? this year. As the year progresses, I'm going to get better and better shape because I had an injury that was really bad in my, I got torn my in labrum, groin, everything. And it took two and a half, three years to get fully recovered. And I'm so excited. And But what's keeping me going is uh, my love for my family. My, my little five and a half year old nieces are spectacular. And, uh, you know, you know the, that, that love for them uh, and love for oneself and love for my fans is uh, a dream come true. Can't write a better script 30 years later. It's actually 31 years. And uh, and uh, it's like there's so much clarity for me when this, uh, uh, lack of a better word, spiritual growth that I had is uh, life becomes very clear, you know, I've done seminars at Landmark Education. That, that's been a huge impact, uh, doing the Landmark Forum and the Curriculum for Living over there. And it's, uh, they've got a wonderful program where you uh, uncover blind spots from your childhood that actually, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy that you create a story when you're a child that you don't even know it's a story anymore. You think it's reality. And so that over there, they, they, un they uncover those stories with you and then you, you're able to shed them away. Um, but the clarity is of purpose. Clarity of purpose is living, in, living an inspiring life, you know, a bold, courageous, inspiring life. There's no other life to live, you know, and you, you don't have, uh, any other moment, but this moment. So if you're talking about it, you're never going to get it done. If you're talking about it, you know, living life is living in action, you know, there's sleeping, and that's good for meditating, sleep meditation, and there's action meditation. <laughs> do you do you meditate in, in the way that a lot of people would think of? I mean, are are you are you a, a are you a yoga practitioner or you know transcendental or, or any of the other? Well, I, things I we do, might do a, a like for me, it's like a yin yang. Like I said, there's sleep meditation where I just do a fa basic meditation to release all thought, you know, mm -hmm. and then I do action meditation. That's more visualization. 
you know. So um, that's kind of how I approach it. That you have to look at both sides. You have the one that's of mind and of no mind. Mm. I like that. And the thing is, of mind, uh, of no mind, when you're just, you know, you shed back all thought, it's the best thing to do is once you've done that and come out of a meditation, to write down who you think you are for people, not just for yourself, but who you think you are for people as a contribution. Because usually of thought, you always find some identity that's based on some ego, looking good, survival type of things. You know, when you do meditation of no thought and there's no looking good, what would be your purpose? You write it down afterwards. What's my purpose? And, and uh, that really inspires me to be for people. You know, then, you know, then you'll find your action meditation will be somewhere in there. Sounds like you've spent a lot of time with this and it's a pretty important part of your daily practices. Yeah, have fun. <laughs> so now let's let's flip the table a little bit. Tell us what you've got going on. I mean, you've got the you've got the book. I mean, you, there's a tour. Yeah, well, the book and the tour is everything. You know, that's everything. I've got all my uh, screenplays and uh, and uh, the Last Dragon sequel is in the book. And we're on tour and fans are coming out and we need more support of fans letting other people know uh, to look at the link. There's incognitobooks.com back, backslash time on. So it's, it's not incognito, which is spelled I-N-C-O-N. Uh, I-N-C-O-G. The, the way uh, my publisher spells it is I-N-C-O-R-G-N-I-T-O, incognitobooks.com backslash timeout. And that's where you can find out what city I'm going to be. I'll be in Detroit on the 15th, and there are many, many more cities that I'm going to, maybe uh, 15 to 20 more cities. Oh, cool. And, you know, for anybody that's new, we will have these links over on the show notes, whistlekickmarshartsradio.com. So, um, you know, the spelling on that's a little weird. Don't worry, we'll get you there. Okay, so so there's there's the tour, Detroit. Any, uh, any other cities off the top oh, of your head yeah, that, well, you know, you're going to be in? They're all in there. Uh, Philly, we're doing L.A. They, L.A. and New York hasn't been posted yet, but the New York one is going to be uh, at um, Urban Action Showcase in November. Um so, but on my Facebook, I got a facebook.com backslash I am Timok, Instagram.com backslash I am Timok. I post, and then there's my website, I am Timok.com. So, uh, Washington, D.C., um, Kansas City, Missouri. Um, uh, there's going to be Virginia, you know, uh, <laughs> all over Atlanta. I just did Chicago. Um, I just did Pittsburgh. I did Dallas, you know, uh, but in the, in the next upcoming cities are the ones I've mentioned. There's so many more, you know? Sure. So if someone comes out to one of these, what can they expect to see? There's Florida. Um, well, they can expect to see fans that love the movie as much as them sitting in a big theater, watching it on a big screen, sitting next to me and taking pictures and having a blast. So it's just kind of like, it, I shouldn't say just, uh, it sounds like a pretty casual, laid back, you know, really fun. Oh, no, no, no. It's, like, it's more, it's fun, you know, but it's it's wild too, you know. I remember one guy was jumping in the aisleway throwing kicks down the aisle. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's like, uh, it's an experience that it's hard to explain. You know, what you'll see from, if you look online, people, their conversations about it, you know. Awesome. Awesome, and so this this sequel is there a there a time frame on that? Well, the time frame is is the script was written. When yeah. Hollywood's ready to take it and do it, then that's when it's going to happen. I don't own the right. I don't own the rights to it. So, oh okay. Kerry okay. Gordy and Sony owns the rights. So I'm, I talked to Kerry Gordy, and he has to get Sony uh, involved, and 
and interested. So that's a thing, you know. You know. Uh, so even though uh, martial arts films are highly successful and and they have a, a strong desire out there in the public, there aren't many made. You know, at least not big ones, and at least not. Uh, so right, right. so for some reason, it takes more to get a martial arts film made than an average film. So even though they make a lot of money. Uh, so the thing is, we got to do what we got to do. We got to like keep picking up the phone, keep calling, keep pushing, you, you know, and keep, keep on it until it gets done. You know? Right on. Well, here, here's to hoping it happens soon because I've been waiting a long time. We've all been waiting a long time for, for that sequel. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sure yeah. You, you, you've been waiting even longer. Yeah. At the end of the book, uh, you tell me what you think of that concept. Carrie Gordy is reading it now. Right on. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm excited, and and I have, I have no doubt that it will happen because it deserves to happen, and and I believe things that should happen do, at least the majority of the time. I'd I'd, I'd put some money down on this one. Yeah, I mean, I, I know that people want it, and they they don't want to remake, obviously, because they kind of shut that down online when they had that idea. But I know people want to see me, and I know people want to see great martial arts and great entertainment, and this would be it. And uh, it just needs some great music, which Kerry Gordy knows all about. He even handled was one of the people who handled Prince's uh, uh, company, Paisley Park. So he's an uh, extraordinary talent. And, uh, you know, Sony, Sony uh, is there, and, 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 you know, they just have to get on board uh, because... People want to see some great, entertaining martial arts films that are going to last a lifetime. Absolutely. We do. We, we undoubtedly do. There's us, and there's a lot of martial artists out there. <laughs> but I think people like martial arts, too. It's not just martial artists. No. No. And, you know, as I said, I think your movie, um, or I shouldn't say your movie because there's more than one, but The Last Dragon. Oh, that's the movie. I think it's, that's the movie. It's, it's, it's the movie, right? Um, but I, I really feel like that's in a, a very small group of movies that transcended so deeply outside of martial arts into general popular culture. You know, we don't have a lot of martial arts films that have done that. So yeah, I think yeah. It's quite I mean, when when, uh, when I before uh, they start the film, the host of, on the tour, the host usually says, "How many people haven't seen the movie?" Normally, it's like two or three people. That the but the last time when in Dallas, there were twenty people in the movie, and and we always ask them at the end how they enjoyed. It. They they are like on fire. <laughs> they loved it. They love it. They love it. So it's it's a, it's a pretty special film. Yeah, yeah, it is. All right. So, any parting words of wisdom for the people that are listening? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know everything. I, I just, I just, uh, for me, in the times we're living, I think uh, that, you know, we have to be bigger people as human beings, you know? Bigger meaning more loving, more understanding, more bold, more courageous, more honest, uh, more uh, fun, more light, you know? Uh, more generous, more unified. That's all I got to say. Thank you for listening to episode 80 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. And thank you to Mr. Guariello. Head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for the show notes, including some rare photos, clips from the movie, and links to everything we talked about today, like upcoming dates on the Last Dragon Tour. If you like the show, make sure you're subscribing or using one of our free apps. They're available on both iOS and Android. For those of you kind enough to leave us a review, remember we randomly check out the different podcast review sites, and if we find your review and mention it on the air, be sure to email us for your free box of Whistlekick stuff. If you know someone that would make a great interview for the show, please fill out the form at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, or if you want to shoot us a message with a suggestion for a Thursday topic show or some other feedback, there's a place to do that too. You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, pretty much everywhere you can think of. And our username is always Whistlekick. Every episode is also on YouTube, so check us out there if you have a chance. 
And remember the products you can find at whistlekick.com, like our comfortable sweatpants. And in recent news, you can also find all of our sparring gear on Amazon. Now, if you're a school owner or team coach, you should check out wholesale.whistlekick.com for our wholesale program. But that's all from us. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.